Here are the top 10 tips for buying your first investment property. And this applies to flips, rental properties, house hacks, where you plan on living there, fixing it up, renting it out. And just a little side note, I kind of do this for a living. Pretty much all I do is look at deals all day. So I've seen quite a few you know, good deals, bad deals. Uh, so that being said, let's jump into the video. Tip number one is something called the law of 100. And I have no idea who came up with this. I've heard it just used in different uh, scenarios. But basically you wanna look at 100 properties before you purchase one. And if you're able to look at 100 properties, chances are you can find you know, the low hanging fruit. You can find you know, the cream of the crop type of deal. Whereas if you only looked at five deals and you purchased the best out of five, chances are it's not gonna be that good of a deal. And that was actually a huge mistake I made when I was first getting started in investing was, I think I looked at like two or three deals and then I bought one. And I bought the worst out of the three. Uh, looking back on it, I bought a studio, which studio condos, almost never appreciate in value. Just keep that in mind. When you're buying condos, try to buy like a two bedroom, three bedroom, one bedrooms are okay, but stay away from studios. But also look at a lot of deals. If somebody sent me a deal halfway across the country or in like, let's say Hawaii or wherever it might be, and they said, what do you think of this deal? Well, I'd have to look at probably at least five, 10, but better yet, if I looked at a hundred deals, I would really know the market and I'd be able to see you know, some inefficiencies and, and see some things that just you know, the values are incorrect and it could be a good deal that you could reposition and sell for a profit. The next tip is actually a quote from the billionaire real estate investor, Sam Zell. And this is just something you should keep in mind when you're evaluating deals because real estate investing is all about evaluating risk. There's always gonna be some level of risk, but if there's enough profit, a lot of times it will make sense to do the deal. And the quote is this, if you have a big potential downside and a small potential upside, you should run away from the deal. However, if you have a small potential downside and a big potential upside, you should do the deal. And this quote's actually saved me a lot of times because I'll be evaluating deals. And when I'm looking at the deals, I'm like, well, in a perfect scenario, if everything were to go correctly, you know, I could probably make a pretty good profit on this deal. However, the more likely scenario is that I probably like break even or even lose money on some of these deals. So you have to be, you know, very conservative and make sure that it's much more likely that you're gonna make a significant profit than you know, the potential downside. Tip number three is that when you're getting started as a real estate investor, you should purchase close to home. Because no matter what type of property you purchase, uh, rental, fix and flip, you know, you're gonna to have to go to that property probably quite a few times, at least in the beginning when you're getting it set up or getting it fixed up. And if you're gonna to have to drive like 45 minutes each way, that's gonna get old very quickly. Even if you have to drive like 30 minutes, I have some properties that are 30 minutes away from me. And maybe I'm just kind of lazy, but I'm like, man, I gotta drive 30 minutes, much less if it was in like some entirely different city. Like I hear about some real estate investors that purchase properties like hours and hours away. And once you get more experienced and you have a good understanding of different markets and maybe you have property managers over there, I think that's completely okay. But when you're getting started, you wanna purchase in an area that you know and that's close by so you can have more you know, control and management over it. One of the first investment deals that I almost bought, and thank God I didn't buy it, was in Baltimore. Good morning, Baltimore. And you're so new to real estate, you don't have any money, so you're just trying to get in. And the, the person told me like the house was like $5,000. I was like, you can buy a house for $5,000? No! And of course, I didn't know anything about Baltimore. Um, and you know, if I were to look, this was probably like 10 or 15 years ago. If I were to look at what the value of that house is right now, it's probably $5,000 if it's even still there. I think Baltimore, I know Detroit is like just been knocking down neighborhoods because there's just so much blight and like some of the city resources can't even reach different parts of the city. So buy in a place you know and, and buy close by. Tip number four is to have reserves. So I think I heard Dave Ramsey talk about this. Your emergency fund is insurance. And he wasn't talking about real estate investing, he was just talking about building up your assets, basically building up your treasure war chest, as he likes to call it. Because when you become a landlord, uh, whether it's your primary residence or you're just renting it out to somebody else, or you're flipping houses, you are gonna have times when you're over budget, when there's things that come up that you're not expecting. And it's more likely to happen when you're first getting started and you just don't really know what you're doing. So you can have reserves in the form of like credit, like being able to access credit. For example, I'd recommend like Chase Cards, American Express has good uh, business as well as personal options. And you can get a pretty long and extensive amount of credit that, that they'll give to you. And you wanna do this when your credit score is high, not when you actually need it. Like I had a, an actual wall collapse at one of my properties. And that's like 25 or $30,000 that insurance is not gonna cover. And this was actually because the wall was like an exterior wall that was pretty far away from the property. It's, it's kind of a long story. Always get good insurance. 
But basically, you see my point. There's going to be unexpected costs. And if you don't have access to a lot of credit or cash or some type of uh, you know money, <laughs> you could get screwed pretty badly. So always try to build out your reserves. Tip number five is to talk to several different lenders when you're evaluating options, whether it's hard money, private money, or even if you're just getting a conventional type of loan or FHA type of loan and you're doing some house hacking, you want to talk to several different lenders. You want to see how they operate, how responsive they are, what their rates are like, what their reviews are like. You want to get a good picture. You don't have to talk to like 100 lenders, but make sure you talk to at least three, four, or five. Because I'll tell you, when I was first getting started, I was basically working with a loan shark hard money lender. I'm not even sure if they're still in business or not. They were basically ripping me off and I was giving them really good deals. They were very difficult to work with, char overcharged me by tens of thousands of dollars. And if I had evaluated different hard money lenders, if I had reached out to private money lenders, I could have realized that every single deal I'd be saving somewhere between ten dollars and $20,000 just on every single deal. That's not even talking about the profit of the deal. That's an additional profit for me. And then once I got my license and started using private money, it's like now I'm saving like twenty to $30,000 sometimes on my deals. So make sure you reach out to many different lenders. Tip number six is that most of the time, the more bedrooms and the more units, the better. So if you're renting out a property, obviously more bedrooms, you can rent each bedroom out for more money. But also in terms of renovations, in terms of flips, if you're listing a property as a three bedroom house, there's gonna be a good portion of buyers that only want four bedroom houses. And especially if it's like a two bedroom house. A two bedroom house is just weird and strange and you probably won't have many buyers at all for that type of property. Uh, but you really wanna be able to have like four bedrooms or if it's like a condo, like <laughs> stay away from studio condos. I know from firsthand experience, that was the first property I bought. Those things don't appreciate at all. If you can get one like dirt cheap and you can just rent it out, that's one thing. But if you're looking for a good combination of cash flow as well as appreciation, I would try, you know, in terms of condos, I'd try to do at least a two bedroom condo. Uh, but better yet, you know, try to go for like more of the multi units when we're talking about rental properties. And then when we're talking about single family, like flips, renovations, try to have, you know, three bedrooms at a bare minimum, but really try to focus on adding an extra bedroom to get to that fourth bedroom. Or in some cases, you might even want to add a fifth bedroom. You know, you have to see what the comps are. You know, if it's a neighborhood where it's only three bedroom houses, that's every single sale, that's okay. But there's a lot of neighborhoods where it might be four or five bedrooms. Um, and I would say though, you don't want to go crazy with it. You don't want to list a house that has like eight bedrooms. That's just gonna, that's gonna be a little unusual and a lot of people probably will be turned off by that. Tip number seven is that when you're evaluating deals, off-market properties are gonna be almost always better than properties listed on the MLS. And look, you can still find great deals on the MLS, but the overwhelming majority of good deals are gonna be found when you're marketing directly to sellers. And it just so happens that I have a video that shows you exactly how I personally market to off-market sellers. I'll put the link below, it's called PropStream shows you who the off-market sellers are and I like to do a combination of direct mail. Some people do text messaging, cold calling. You basically just need to contact the right off-market sellers and that video goes more into depth on that. But when you're marketing directly to a seller, that is when you're going to get the best deal because if someone lists it on the market, it's going to be seen by, you know, 10,000 people. Whereas if it's just you marketing to them, it might just be you and like one or two other investors and oftentimes you can make a deal. Tip number eight for your first investment property is do not buy just for appreciation. Appreciation is literally impossible to predict. Now there's some neighborhoods that are transitioning that you know you would probably put, you know, you probably bet money that they will appreciate, but you never know. You know, in the market crash of 2007, there were neighborhoods like that where people lost a lot of money. You never know what the market's going to do. You have no control over that. So you always want to have kind of like, you know, keep in mind the risk, keep in, keep in mind the downside as well as the upside. So if you're buying in an area that you think is gonna just blow up and has all this future potential appreciation, make sure in a worst case scenario that you can still rent it out for the cash flow and make some money every single month. A lot of people got in trouble when they were just buying for appreciation and then every one of their properties was like losing 500 or $1,000 every single month. Tip number nine is to take on an easy project first. I'll talk to uh, new real estate investors all the time and you know they'll tell me about these different projects, like what do you think about this deal, what do you think about that? And it'll be like some massive condo conversion project when you know they haven't even like fixed up a house before. And it's fine if you want to get into those bigger projects and eventually you should. You should evolve as a real estate investor. I see so many agents and investors that are like doing the same types of small deals that they were doing like 10 years ago. So your goal should be to evolve. But start with something that you can handle when you're getting started and work your way up to that. 
you know, unless you come from some construction background or have experience with those types of deals. There's so many variables and time frames and just so many different things, moving, moving pieces that are going around that you're not even aware of. You just kind of look at the numbers and you say, okay, well, if I can like buy this piece of land and then build these townhouses and they, they cost 200,000 each to build for new construction, then I can sell them for 600K. I just made a 400K profit on every single one. And it's really not like that. Wait a minute. You have to know what you're doing with some of these bigger development projects because there are so many different things that can come up. I'll tell you a quick story. There was a very uh, successful real estate agent in, in, in my area. And I believe during 2007, 2008, when everyone was buying homes right before the crash, he tried his hand at development. And he had all this experience as an agent, but he never really like fixed and flipped houses, never done any projects. And he tried to do like some massive subdivision. And it was a complete failure. And unfortunately, he was a really good real estate agent. So I think he lost some money, but it wasn't like the end of his career or anything like that. But start with smaller projects and work your way up. The next tip is to get your real estate license. All it's going to cost you is, you know, a few hundred bucks in, you know, pre-licensing education, maybe another hundred bucks to take the test. Maybe you're all in for like a thousand dollars to actually sign up with a brokerage. But the reasons you want your license are number one, you want to get MLS access. You don't want to just rely on like Zillow or Redfin. And those sites can be helpful. They're, you know, they're pretty good. But the MLS data is really what you want to be able to access. And then secondly, you're going to save a ton of money by having your license because you can list your own properties. If you find a good deal on the MLS that you want to purchase, you can do that as an agent and save another, you know, 10,000 or however much it's going to be with, you know, two and a half or 3% commission. There is this uh, investor I know, he's pretty well known on like Instagram and social media and he does a lot of flips. So he does some commercial too, some multifamily, but he was saying he saved like two or $300,000 every single year from having his license and also being an investor. So it's, it's pretty much a no brainer. There's fees associated to every business and real estate investing, your only cost basically is like your marketing and then just getting your license. You know, pay a few hundred bucks, get your license. So thanks for watching this video and be sure to watch this one right here and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.